We delve into secret Britain now as broadcaster and anthropologist Mary Anna Hotter returns to the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival to talk with Paul Blezard. Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to yet another fabulous event brought to you by the fantastic folk who run the Edward Stanford's Travel Writers Festival. This year, 2021 edition is the special limited digital edition um, as unfortunately, uh, with COVID restrictions, Olympia wouldn't let us through the doors, let alone let all of you through the doors to sit tightly packed with each other and to watch Marianne Ahota telling you stuff about secret Britain that you never, ever knew. Marianne Ahota is a familiar face on TV archaeology programmes, including the Cult Show Time Team, History Channel's Ancient Impossible, BBC Britain Afloat, and the hit Smithsonian Channel show Mystic Britain, which she co-presents with wonderful Clive Anderson. She's also the author of Hidden Histories, a spotter's guide to the British landscape, which was published in 2016 by Francis Lincoln, and which she follows up, and which she's here to talk about today, uh, with Secret Britain, Unearthing Our Mysterious Past. Mary Ann, before we get stuck into Secret Britain, you are such a brilliant communicator about the passion that you have for what lies beneath the soil. Can you just give us a little bit of a heads up on onto how you got started who influenced you? Because I have a feeling you are influ influencing the next generation of young, hopefully female archaeologists and are, and are a beacon for them to follow. Oh, well, Paul, that's a, a very kind introduction. Thank you. And thank you to, for, to Stanford's for having me uh, speak at this festival. Um, I love it. And it's uh, going to be just as cool online. I'm sure of it. Um, so how did I get involved in archaeology and anthropology uh, initially? Honestly, I watched a TV show when I was about 14 um, and it was about these two mountaineers who were also archaeologists and they climbed a, a mountain in, in the Andes and they were excavating the remains of a a frozen ice mummy that was eroding out of the permafrost at the top of this mountain, Mount Ampato. And they excavated the remains of um, another climber had found the remains and they thought it was someone who died on an expedition. And then it became clear that actually this was a, an ancient body and it was perfectly preserved because the ice had preserved it. And it was actually a 12 year old girl who had been taken up there as a human sacrifice. And because of the state of preservation, they could do all sorts of incredible study about what this girl had, what her life had been like, what her last meal was, how her diet had changed probably in the year before she was sacrificed, where she had been sort of selected for this great honor and given a very different meal because she was going to be given to the gods. And it totally blew my mind, the very idea that this was a job, that you could go off doing adventuring, traveling, seeing the world, doing exciting things, but also digging so deep into the past and revealing a way that people live that is so different to how we understand the world. And yet they're human. They're trying to make sense of the world just like we are. So the idea that a family would think that their child being selected to be ritually murdered would be a great honour. I was like, oh, how do you get your head around that? And that's what ultimately led me to anthropology, because that's what anthropology is. It's the study of people. And you've got kind of two elements to it, biological anthropology and social anthropology. Um, and biological anthropology is um, a sort of more, more biological basis. So how we've evolved, um, things about um, human disease and epidemiology, um, how we're related to apes and other mammals. Um, but then there's also social anthropology, which kind of brings together elements of sociology, psychology, philosophy, economics. And it's trying to understand how people structure their their worlds how we understand the world how we develop belief systems how we develop political systems how we um kind of explain ourselves to ourselves and all the kind of rich different cultural ways that humans have come up with solving those problems and kind of asking tricky questions and i thought oh that is the subject for me that is a subject that is constantly fascinating and i think when I went to university, I studied it in conjunction with archaeology. And since graduating and in the course of my um, career, writing, doing TV shows, radio, 
I've been drawn more and more to the archaeology, partly because I think a lot of those anthropological questions are entirely relevant for asking about historical and prehistory periods, because the people from 5,000 years ago who were building Stonehenge or people from 11,000 years ago who were kind of working out the first principles of farming through to someone in 1997, you know, with a, a, a kind of a Walkman, we all those questions about kind of what does it mean? What does this say about your status? What kind of conversation verbal or otherwise you're having with the people around you? How do you make sense of difference? And who do you think is the same as you? All those questions are still relevant. We still try to understand ourselves and the people and the world around us. And I think that's what I've always tried to bring to the work that I do in archaeology, like those questions of like, well, why are they doing that? That's weird. I mean, it might look weird to us, but maybe it was weird to them too. And I think, I mean, that's something that uh, appeals to all travellers. I think that's one of the reasons that we, uh, and I, I guess, you know, most of the audience who are here at, at the festival today, um, that's that's why that's why we travel. That's why we want to explore other cultures. That's why we want to go beyond the familiar, because we are driven by that same curiosity. And I just feel incredibly fortunate that I had a chance to study it and then have been able to make a career out of being incredibly nosy and going, why? Why are you doing that? That's really odd. Or why were they doing that in the past? That's really odd. Um, and then asking that question of ourselves as well. It's very odd that I'm, I've got weird bits of metal in my ears or that I'm sitting on a chair talking to a screen. How do I think that that's a, a sensible thing to do? And we kind of, we do need to explain it, even if it seems quite sensible to us at the time. It might not be to someone a generation's time later. Jo, I, I like the way you put that. That's one, lucid, and two, actually rather profound in many ways. I, one of the degrees I read for was geology. And when I was studying reading geology, I shared a house with a, a, an archaeologist, and she was explaining, which I knew nothing about, I was very naive, and she explained to me that effectively archaeology is time travel. And I like the way that we are fortunate to have you as a sort of communicator of this time travel for people who we are, who we have been derived from, who are our ancestors. Before we get into Secret Bit in the book, there's one last question I want to ask you, one further question I, I want to ask you. What over the course of your career in archaeology slash anthropology has been the greatest scientific advance that has opened up doors that were closed to those who came before you, would you say? Oh, wow. Well, I think this is a, a new age of possibility and we're very much, you know, just at the start because you've got the kind of the capacity of super, super blah, blah, blah. you've got the capacity of supercomputers to crunch huge amounts of data. Uh, you've got the ability of all sorts of dating techniques to take samples that are viable from something that otherwise wouldn't have, have been possible even five or ten years ago. So, for example, something like radiocarbon dating, when that first came um, onto the scene, I guess, um, you'd need to take a massive chunk of bone um, or whatever the organic material it is that you're trying to date, and you would have to grind up the whole thing and then apply the various chemical processes before you can then get a radiocarbon date. And then you have to calibrate that in order to work out what actual date it is. Nowadays, well, two things. One, they've done a radical uh, overhaul of the calibration of the dates, so it's much more accurate, and you can we can narrow things down. But instead of taking a piece of, of bone like this big that you have to grind up, you can take something that's a tiny little drill hole worth of material that you can then date. And so it means that you haven't destroyed the whole sample. It means that you've retained as much as possible for people in the future to apply other techniques to study when they go, oh, God, they were in the dark ages back in 2021. What were they doing? Why did they think that was a good idea? Because it's so easy for us now to look at antiquarian excavators from the 1800s digging into mounds looking for treasure going, oh, they, they've just ruined it. They've destroyed everything. And some of them were just looking for treasure and kind of, you know, to try and make themselves look great. But other people were genuinely trying to discover the best they could about the past. And they'd make careful drawings and they'd write down various um, uh, 
you know, details that they were observing. And we look at those and we kind of go, oh, yeah, but they're not very good. And there's a kind of like fanciful sketch and whatnot. Whereas now we can do 3D photogrammetry and get a photo pixel perfect representation of something that will then be excavated and then doesn't exist anymore. Or we can do lots of geophysical or remote surveying. So we're not actually digging into anything at all. So we're not damaging it further. Um, and nowadays you, you and I can walk around with our phones and look at LIDAR images, so these uh, laser images of, of land surfaces where you can see all the different lumps and bumps and shapes. You can look at satellite imagery, you can pull up um, the environmental historic records online which are all digitised, so you can kind of stand on a lumpy bumpy mound in a field and go, well what is this thing? What images can I look at? How will it help me interpret and understand what this might be. And you can do it all right there and right then in real time with accurate records. And back in the day, you'd have to really want to do it. You'd have to go to the, uh, you know, the, the historic records office. You'd have to ask a special permission from English Heritage to pull up um, or Historic England to pull up, you know, aerial photography. Now you just look on Google Earth. Jobs are good. Un. I know. I was describing this to somebody the other day saying, um, the advances of uh, of archaeology now with the science that we have is a bit like giving a 19th century, 18th century, 19th century archaeologist the kit. The, it's a bit like giving Copernicus the Hubble telescope and him saying, now I can really see what's going out there and not having to guess. I was going to say the thing that's really the thing that's really fascinating is that even though we have all these advances in, in the kind of the research techniques, the interpretation still throws up so many of those questions like why what did they mean when they did this because the the scientific data that we're working with takes you so far but then you have to interpret it and that is an informed but imaginative leap and i think that's what drew me to writing hidden histories which is a spotter's guide to the british landscape encouraging people to get out into the world and look for lumps and bumps and strange things and try and puzzle out what the landscape is trying to tell them, you know, hidden in plain sight. But it's also what drew me to writing um, Secret Britain, which is a collection of both artefacts and sites where they are fundamentally mysterious. Not all the questions are answered, even though we've got cutting edge research to work with some of the more fundamental questions why did they do that what were they intending what did they believe why was this place special those questions remain to some extent unanswered and that's why i think they're still compelling that's why they still resonate with us today because you can go to these places or look at these artifacts and go i don't know either but it's mysterious and it's compelling and i want to know more there you go. If you're at school or university, or if you're at school and wondering what the hell to do with your life, read everything, be curious about everything, and sign up for an archaeology course. Right. Bring us, you say, about special and mystical sites. Let's get on to the book. Sorry about the preamble, but it's been fascinating. Take us to uh, the first thing we, the first place we've decided to have a look at in this superb book of your Secret Britain, Unearthing Our Mysterious Past. Yeah, should I wave it at you? you wave? Yeah, here we go. Pack shot. Double pack shot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to write my name on it in Sharpie so that I don't actually ever post this one to someone because it's it's quite dog-eared. But it's very, I have to say, absolute credit to the publishers. They have made a beautiful book. Um, we work quite hard to get the, um, the, the pictures. So it's like full colour. It's a real good, it's a, do you know what? It's a really good book for lockdown, I have to say, because when I was writing it, um we were just going into kind of it came out quite quickly eventually because i i wrote it quite slowly um and i was just we were just getting into the kind of the, the clouds you know massing on the the horizon this time last year and um when i finally saw it i was like oh this is it's like um it's like a window into the world so i'm really proud i'm really proud that it came out this year and that it's given people joy and hopefully uh, some of the audience today uh, if you're so inclined then it's um an opportunity to travel in your mind while we have to actually keep our bums in one place and you can plan loads of trips plan now visit later nicely put tell us what happened in pavilan 33,000 years ago and why it's important and of interest to you 
Okay, um, a really good one to start with. Uh, it's the oldest site in uh, the book. It's um, a, a cave on the Gower Peninsula in South Wales called Pavland or Goat's Hole Cave. And if you're if you're adventurously inclined, you can climb into it. You either need to scramble across the rock face, um, sort of do a traverse, or you need to wait for low tide and then you can climb down the rocks on one side and up the rocks halfway up the cliff uh, to the other side. So this beautiful teardrop shaped cave. There's not much in it now. It's it's a very remarkable site. It feels like a like a place, you know. It, feels like somewhere of significance and nowadays when you stand at the edge of the cave halfway up this cliff and you look out you're looking onto the the rocks that are basically the the Bristol estuary and 33,000 years ago if you'd been standing at the at the edge of the cave looking out you would have been looking out at a, a dry plain because the river was down way way down um on the other side kind of like near the Devon coast and so you would have this was a period that was still the ice age but this was a, a warmer period and what appears to be clear is that at that time people were walking across from continental Europe across the land bridge that was still in existence so we weren't an island Britain wasn't an island it was uh, attached to um, France and and the Netherlands by 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 not the North Sea but by land and Doggerland, and people would have walked across and they were basically probably following um, the large herds of game who would also have walked across because they were grazing as they walked. And so these hunter gatherers, anatomically modern humans, just like us, put them in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and give them a smartphone and you wouldn't recognize the difference. Um, so people just like us, but probably small bands of perhaps extended families would have traveled um, foraging as they went, um, hunting as they went, perhaps collecting resources that would otherwise have been quite rare or quite special, like particular types of shells. The reason that we know that people were in Britain, in South Wales at this time, is every now and then you find a tiny bit of a stone tool or something like that, but that's very rare. What we found in, or what they found in the 1800s actually, in Goat's Hole Cave, in Pavland Cave, is the earliest human burial ever found in Britain. And the bones have been radiocarbon dated to around 33,000 years old. And the body, most famously known as the Red Lady of Pavland, but we'll come to that in a minute, um, the body is only partial. When they first excavated it, they probably also had the skull, but at some point someone lost it, rather unhelpfully. But the bones are covered in red ochre. So red ochre is a hematite. It's like a, an iron oxide and it's a naturally occurring mineral that you can find. Some places you have to kind of dig underground, but other times you can see it up at the surface. And all the bones are covered in this, this kind of bright, rusty orange red colour, like a blood red colour. And it's really remarkable because the thing that's special about this is that that's not naturally occurring. Um, and it seems likely that it was probably the body itself that was covered in red ochre or perhaps the clothes. And then as the, the flesh rotted away and the clothes rotted away, um, the red ochre powder that is a, a kind of quite a stable mineral just settled down onto the bones instead. So what we've got now are these red stained bones. Um, so hence red, but it's not actually a lady. Uh, the first interpretation in the 1820s when this site was first excavated uh, was that um, this was a woman. And maybe the reason that she was read and buried in a cave was because she was some kind of prostitute or, you know, fallen woman. And that she'd been kind of sent to, to go and live out her days in the cave. Or maybe she, she was, um, you know, kind of providing services, shall we say, to the Roman legionaries who, who were in the area back in the Iron Age. And actually, it turns out it's way, way older than that, way before the Romans. And uh, not a woman, probably a young man in his 20s. Um, so red is correct, but lady, not so much. Uh, Pavaland, yes, we'll, we'll accept that. So he's now the red 
man of Paviland, I think probably, and uh, not a, not a fallen not a fallen lady of the night. Um, possibly someone who there's no evidence from the bones that we have of how or why he died. So there's no kind of great damage where he was you know trampled by a woolly rhinoceros or shot in the heart with a kind of stone spear um so we don't know why he died could have been something like rubbish like um like a you know like a an infected tooth abscess something really boring that kind of killed you when you didn't have antibiotics and dentists or it could have been something kind of you know most remarkable he was killed in a in a hunting accident or something like that. He, he might have just like fallen over. We don't know. Um, but what's certain is that he was given some kind of very, very special burial. At that time, there wouldn't have been very many people in Britain. Um, but it seems very unlikely that most people were given a kind of a serious burial to be covered in, in red ochre mineral. Um, he also had a, a mammoth skull. Uh, placed just above his own head so he was kind of laid down flat and there was a mammoth skull above his head and he was also buried with little ivory rods so about kind of that big mammoth ivory rods now mammoth ivory is really hard it's really hard material. it's like elephant ivory really hard material and um, we don't actually know what the rods are some people have said that they might be like tiny ones and that he was like perhaps a shaman other people have suggested that maybe they're the blanks for um, making beads and that for some reason, perhaps if they were on this man's possession when he died, then the, the kind of material becomes tainted or bad luck or something like that. And so you have to bury the stuff with him because otherwise you're going to bring bad luck or upset the spirits or something like that. Um, or they might be gifts to some kind of gods or for the afterlife or for him to take with him. So it's 33,000 years ago, and we are asking questions about what people thought about the afterlife, how they made sense of what happens when someone they love dies, or someone they uh, see as being powerful or important, or, you never know, dangerous. He might have died or might have been a person in life who was kind of considered dangerous or kind of you know, hard to handle in some way. And so something about his burial, covering him in red ochre, putting him in a cave halfway up a cliff, carefully being looked after by a big mammoth head. We don't know, but that might have been to kind of keep him put so he didn't wander and cause trouble. We don't know. We can kind of bring our own ideas to it. We don't want him to be a zombie and come back and haunt us. So we're going to put him in this cave and cover him in red ochre. Or maybe it's because he was the most loved son or the most worshipped shaman. We don't know. It's so exciting um, because those questions can't really be answered by by the data. At that point, my guess is as good as your guess, Paul, is as good as anybody else's guess. And so it becomes a very level playing field for us all to um, become, you know, critical interpreters of our shared history well you say your guess is as good as my guess my guess would be he lost his mobile phone and was looking for it so your guess is a lot better than mine and he fell down the cliff and then got trampled by a woolly mammoth <laughs> yeah exactly exactly i'll point this out though Thirty-three thousand years ago that's thirty-two thousand bc and timely enough, your mention of red ochre and, and the, the way that the ochre has been absorbed into the skeleton. Of course, we had the uh, announcement today that they found the world's oldest known cave painting in Indonesia, which is thought to be 45,000 years ago, and which, like the caves of Lascaux, has the handprints where somebody has sprayed red ochre and saliva over their hand. I mean, there was a lot going on then that we still don't know about. But it's nice to know that it was also happening here in Britain as well. It's a part of secret Britain that we're still trying to uncover. There is so much work yet to be done. Yeah, and it's really interesting, this link with red ochre, because you find it, like you say, it's a really fun craft project, actually. If you've got kids and you're trying to work out things to do with them while you're homeschooling and they don't want to do their Google Classroom or whatever, you can make Stone Age cave paintings, which is super fun because basically it involves spitting through a straw kids love it so do adults let's be honest All good. um <laughs> yeah. and you can say it's educational so it's a win-win just choose the wall you choose um, to do it on very carefully not all of us are banksy 
exactly and no spitting in each other's faces that's forbidden even the stone age folk weren't in, into that so um yeah you're right and i think it's it's really interesting as soon as we find these little details across the world you see this link that that red ochre seems to have been something that was significant to all sorts of different populations of people right 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 from very very early times and it does have um sort of practical uses as well it's a, it's quite a good insect repellent um it can stop you getting um sunburnt um there are um cultural tribes in uh africa now who use red ochre and they'll cover their faces very very thickly because it's considered beautiful as well as protective of the the, the skin and as a, a kind of a tribal marker and so you can use it to mark yourself and you can use it to to mark other things that are important um but it, it appears to be very commonly commonly used now the question is not so much indonesia and south wales that's probably not a a, a kind of cultural link where someone was kind of had a pen pal and they were discussing different uses of of art and you know memorializing the dead or anything like that but we do see red ochre burials not just in in south wales but also across northern europe and and into um what is what is now kind of russia and the steppe um and you think actually maybe that is some kind of possible shared cultural um world that actually has some kind of ancestral culture where people were using these materials either that or people in south wales discovered red ochre and thought it was really cool and people in uzbekistan discovered red ochre and thought it was really cool as well so it could have been kind of uh, different um lines of of kind of this cultural evolution or it could have been shared or it could have been the branches of uzbekistan and south wales where those branches bifurcated that was common knowledge that traveled with them exactly exactly and constantly across all human cultures if if uh, if languages have just two color we have about 11 different color terms and then you can kind of add to them and other in english there are other languages that have lots and lots of color terms and you know it's kind of that um you know how many words does an inuit have for snow they don't actually have like 37 as, as people always say um, but you could kind of describe the colour of the sea, the colour of the sky, all sorts of different kind of blues. Um, but some languages only have two or three colour terms. And if you've only got two, you have generally light and dark. And if you have three colour terms, you have light, dark or black and white and red. And so there's something very significant about red. It's a, it's a kind of very visceral thing. It has very strong, immediate kind of um imaginative links with with life with death with childbirth with meat um and so maybe that's a significance too that perhaps by covering a dead body with red ochre you're bringing life back or some some kind of spirit of life we don't know speculate at will blood holding iron and being red of course there are fantastic links i'm one can imagine there but this is your department not mine I am aware that we're half an hour into a 45 minute show and we've only covered one item. Shall we rattle through the next in, in, in a little bit of pace? Can you take us please to the Cheddar Gorge? And we have a rather lovely gruesome image. So for those of you, of you of um, sensitive disposition, you might want to look away now, which is a human skull used as a vessel with the top cut off. What the hell is going on here, Marianne? That's right. Uh, so this was discovered in uh, Cheddar Gorge in Goff's Cave and it is a skull cup and it dates from around 14,700 years ago. Uh, again, so still in the Ice Age, but a different uh, warm period where people had all shipped out or died because it got very cold and then it got warmer again. And so they came and lived in Somerset, very nice place to live. Um, this appears to be ritual cannibalism. Um, either people who had died already um, are then treated in a way, their bodies are treated in a way that is probably an honour rather than a kind of a gruesome thing, but um, and, and not so much kind of eating your enemies, but uh, the bodies that we find in Goff's cave are men, women and children, 
And not only have some of the skulls been modified in order to make these cups or, or bowls, perhaps, um, there are also things like um, arm bones where they have like really careful little um, engravings on them, sort of like a little hash set of hash marks. Because one of the first interpretations was, OK, if you're living in a cave in the Ice Age and you fail, the, the hunt fails or you can't find enough food, maybe it's starvation cannibalism, you know, like the first person to die or, OK, we're going to all draw lots and it's you. So we're going to eat you first because otherwise we're all going to, you know, cark it. Um, but it doesn't seem to be that case because it's too careful. If you're starving to death, you don't then sit there kind of, you know, whiling away an evening engraving your, your you know, your great aunt's arm bone. So, again, it's it's massively intriguing. These are people in Britain. These people are entirely modern in in the kind of anatomical, physiological, cognitive way. And um, they are doing ritual cannibalism. And we don't know why. But it's, it's very cool in Somerset. Weird things happen in Somerset. <laughs> I would take I take issue with that the, the assumption that it's ritual because of course as we I've been reading about cannibalism recently for um a book I'm working on which is not too gruesome but of course the t the taboo of cannibalism is very much a sort of post Christian term that was sort of enhanced over the last two hundred years prior to Christianity there is a huge amount of evidence it turns out for both ritual and survival cannibalism. So when you say it's unlikely that you might be gnawing on a bone and then whittling on your great aunt's bone afterwards, I i mean, I have no justification academically for this, but I can see if you're stuck in a cave when you finish a meal and there's still heat of the fire, you might actually scratch one bone against another bone and try and come up with a pretty picture. Well, yeah, it, it does appear um, that they have they have kind of done things like split the bones to get the marrow to get to the marrow. So they are using it as a, and perhaps uh, the skull cups as well, they would have eaten the brain. Um, now, the question is whether you're treating that meat or that, that kind of flesh as just a food source or whether it's a food source with kind of added value. And that's not to say that humans were treated differently to other animals because you get lots of cross-cultural examples of animals you wouldn't eat or animals that you have to eat in particular ways. Um, so people, for example, in the UK generally would not choose to eat their pet dog when their pet dog died because it breaks too many cultural taboos in the same way that even if it was legal, you wouldn't choose to honour you know, a grandparent by by having a nibble. That might be a little bit odd. Um, <laughs> but, you know, who's to say you are what you eat? So if you want to keep people have um, ashes turned into diamonds and things like that instead. So there are culturally acceptable ways of transforming bodies into something that is a memory or something that is a special part of you. It's just perhaps uh, not so much Sunday dinner, more, you know, a nice piece of jewellery. Exactly. But as we know, you know, three and a half thousand, 20, 35,000, 15,000, two and a half thousand years is a long time in, in, Brit in human sociological evolution. And we have come a long way and occasionally regress. We can't talk about secret Britain. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big I'm a big believer that there's no kind of upward trajectory of progress. We just do different stuff. Um, yeah. So we think we're very clever and advanced now, but we're not. <laughs> I defer to Barack Obama on this, who very wisely said, history is not a straight line, it zigs and zags. Let's come to, you can't talk about archaeology in Britain. It seems to be a rule in broadcast. You can't talk about archaeology in Britain without invoking the name of a henge made of stone. Can you talk us through what we currently know about Stonehenge and um Proselli, what the importance of Proselli is to Stonehenge as we now know as the facts as the science has taught us okay so if I ask you to imagine Stonehenge uh you're thinking of the the kind of the stones in the middle right Stonehenge actually stopped... and the circle on the outside oh and the circle oh, all right okay well we, there you go Paul so you're already one step ahead there's a big circle there's a, a kind of an earthwork circle on the outside and that is the earliest part of the monument. 
so that is a henge and it's similar to the henge that you will find at Durrington Walls, which is a little bit up the road. Definitely worth visiting because that's the kind of linked site that is linked to Stonehenge via the River Avon, probably where um, some of the builders were living, possibly also a place where um, celebrations and rituals started that then perhaps finished at Stonehenge after people travelled up the river or across the land. Um, so go and visit Durrington Walls. There's uh, no big visitor centre, there's no tickets, there's just a little lay-by where you park up and you have to make sense of it yourself. It's National Trust land on one side and English Heritage land on the other side. It's definitely one for the walkers and the wanderers because it gives you free range to explore and interpret this site for yourself. Um, also go up 20 miles up the road to Avebury, a super henge, absolutely massive site that is just phenomenal. And Stonehenge can be quite frustrating sometimes because that little stone bit in the middle is surprisingly small. You know, it looms so large in our, our kind of collective imaginations. It's massive. And then you get to it and because you have to stay quite a distance away from it, it's only 30 metres across the stone bit and you kind of go, oh, is that it? If you get, I uh, this winter, I was really fortunate to have the chance to go in and go near to the stones because I was filming with English Heritage and you can find the video on YouTube. It's about the midwinter alignments on, on Stonehenge and Durrington Walls. And when you get up close to these stones you realize just how massive this thing is and how beautifully finished these stones were and when you're in the center of the circle surrounded by these sarsen stones you feel like you're in a place even though it's a ruin of what it would have been originally and, and many of the stones are missing they've been dragged away or broken up or what have you some of them have been re-erected um that they're, they're in the places that we think they were around 2400 BC, so the kind of final phase. So the first phase is this henge earthwork around the outside and Stonehenge actually started off as a, um, a, a burial site, a cemetery for cremation burials. So when you go to Stonehenge you'll see these like little disc markers on the floor and they say Aubrey holes and they look about like that big, they're a bit rubbish, but they actually mark the sites of meat pits that were about one and a half meters across and they had um, burials in them uh, that had been cremated elsewhere and then the kind of the ashes had been gathered up and buried. And we know that there are at least 150 individuals buried there, but that all the Albury holes have not been excavated. So we definitely need to add to that number. And there are men, there are women, there are children, and not all of them are from the local area. So right from the beginning, Stonehenge was a little bit special. When you say burials, Marianne, can we say... Can you just, yes. can you be, is it ash? Is it bone? What's, what has been buried? So it's, if you imagine a kind of a cremation fire um, with a, a big heap of wood and you put the body on top and you set it alight and you let it all burn down. And then once it's cooled, someone would go and collect up the obvious pieces of human bone and some of the ash. So now when you collect a cremation from a, a kind of a modern cremation, they um, they prepare the bones so that you're not going to kind of then be confronted by like a big bit of leg or something like that. But in Neolithic times, there wasn't that kind of consistency and, and the fires weren't as hot as a kind of modern crematorium. And so you don't get just this plain ash. You get little pieces of bone, which is amazing because it means that we can radiocarbon date them. We can do isotope analysis to find out where someone was born, what kind of foods they were eating, whether they've traveled in their lifetime. Uh, we can tell whether they're male or female and you can count numbers of individuals because you can find unique parts of the, um, the skeleton. Like, you know, everybody only has one left inner ear bone. So you pick out the number of inner ear bones. And uh, there's a, a researcher called Dr. Christy Willis who literally did this with millions of pieces of cremated bone and went, OK, that's one individual. It took her years and years and years and she's done it. That was an amazing piece of work. Um, but the thing is, yeah, right from the beginning, um, Stonehenge was drawing people from far and wide, far, far, far beyond the local area. And that's the link with Priscelli, which is in West Wales. These outcrops of beautiful blue stone, 
it's kind of grey blue it's not like bright blue um and they were brought from west wales to stonehenge and they formed the the smaller stones i mean they're still two to three meters high they're still like three tons worth of stone but compared to the massive massive sarsens that are kind of 20 tons uh, they look smaller and they form a sort of an inner horseshoe in uh, an inner circle inside the sarsens and then uh, again inside that again is the giant um horseshoe of, of these trilithons so two vertical two vertical stones and a, a horizontal stone so trilith three stone so trilithon yeah um and so there's a link with Priscelli. For some reason, um, those stones were brought a very long way, about 140 kilometers at, at least, probably overland, they think now. they've uh, Archaeologists have decided that probably trying to float them by raft in the sea would not have been as sensible as carrying them overland. Um, but either way, I mean, it's, it's a massive undertaking and rather daft in terms of practicality. If you, if you just want stone, you could get it locally. And so what do these stones signify? Who was it that was giving them or bringing them or, or probably not selling them in any sense of the way? And also the dating from the quarry sites that we found in Priscelli is earlier than the dates that the stones are erected at Stonehenge. And so we don't know where these stones were. There's a kind of a missing mystery monument that maybe it was somewhere in Wales, Maybe it was somewhere en route. Maybe it was somewhere else in the Stonehenge landscape before these stones are then erected in the places that we now find them at Stonehenge. So even though Stonehenge has been studied and studied and studied and visited by a million people a year, there are still so many fascinating questions that uh, remain to be answered. So those people who are kind of going, I don't know what to do with my life. Maybe I want to study archaeology. There are many, many questions that you can set your minds to. Absolutely. There's research waiting to be done. I'm aware of your right shoulder. It looks to me on your cabinet de curiosity that you have a picture that right behind your right shoulder, yeah. a card of what looks like the altar from, from uh, Stonehenge. Is that right? Um, It's a... Uh... It's a really cool artist who I discovered on um, uh, on Instagram, and he's called the Silicon Tribesman, and he takes really cool pictures and do really beautiful, like pen and ink sketches. So his name is Simon de Corsi, and his um, Instagram is at Silicon Tribesman, and it's really cool. Uh, so I bought these. I bought these on Etsy off him because I love them. I'm going to get them framed. Oh, my God. Enough plugging. I know. He's, he's I don't know that. him. I've never met him. He's, he's got a I've free never commercial. Met him, but, um, yeah, exactly. I recommend him. Really lovely photos. Can we, one last question on Stonehenge. Do we know who? What do we know about who erected it, given the sort of three phases, BC, of construction and reorganisation in Stonehenge? Can you give us any insights into that up to current day, Marianne? Okay, so um, it starts off being constructed um, with this earth earthwork circle, this henge enclosure, um, probably ceremonial of some description, um, about 3000 BC. So that's solidly in the Neolithic, the late Stone Age. And then about 500 years later, they start to move and construct this stone monument in the middle of the henge. Now, People had always thought that henges were um, kind of quite straightforward, that they were some kind of circle that people would walk into. You'd kind of go through little gaps in the in the ditch and the bank. That's what makes a henge, a, a, a bank and then a ditch. Um, and then they do stuff inside it, maybe, you know, kind of ceremonies or maybe it would be simple, like it's a marketplace. But now it seems the more research we do, the, the kind of more finessed the techniques are. Um, the more complicated these henges appear. There's there's lots of different ways that they're being used. Some of them have structures inside them. Some of them seem very empty. Some of them seem kind of, you know, littered with bits of animal remains. Others seem very, very clean. So we're not really sure whether people were using them in different ways in different parts of the country or whether um, there's, you know, actually what we think of as a class of monument actually wouldn't have made sense to people back then. They would have said, oh, well, that's different to that because that one's a, you know, that's for discos and that's for, 
for for meeting marriage partners what on earth are you talking about they're not the same even though they're both circular earthworks and um, so we've got that kind of first stage at Stonehenge 3000 BC with the earthwork and something in the middle and then about 2500 BC uh, they start to put the stones up and this is an enormous engineering feat it would require uh, planning design and then the coordination of hundreds if not thousands of workers we don't know whether they're slaves whether they are people kind of giving their labor as a, a tribute or as um sort of uh, you know a, a requirement to the the leaders of the land the tribal leaders um we're not sure but it's not kind of any old person turns up with a chisel like these are people who actually know what they're doing in the same way that i couldn't build a bridge that would be able to kind of help uh, enable um you know a convoy of vehicles to get over it safely i'd require some kind of structural engineer who knew what they were doing um it's the same in the stone age in order to move these enormous sarsen stones in order to get them upright in order to engineer them so that they fit perfectly together to form a beautiful lintel that circles the whole monument and that it's all done within a few decades to a few centuries you know this is pretty quick like imagine um, a, a kind of a medieval uh, cathedral being built up from the ground it's that level of endeavor and effort and constant work at the site and it's perfectly aligned for midsummer sunrise and midwinter sunset so this is about astronomical observation it's possibly about worshipping to the gods and it's it's an incredible place and it continues to be important for hundreds of years if not thousands of years later and then it's still important to people now you've mentioned the word sarsen on two or three occasions i know it has its origin in sarsen in saracen could you explain where the phrase comes from please marianne so the sarsen stones are the local sandstone from the marlborough downs the really big stones and when they would have been first um chiseled they would have been quite white now they're now everything's a bit gray but originally the blue stones from west wales would have been much bluer and the sarsen stones would have been much whiter sort of bone white color fresh bone and sarsen isn't a name that they would have used in the neolithic that it's a name that was kind of coined um much later and it's a like like you say paul it's um it's a, a kind of a derivation of saracen stone which is originates in medieval christian people trying to make sense of these ancient monuments and anything that isn't christian is kind of the other and for them the other was muslim saracens from you know from the crusades and from from elsewhere in in the world and so these were saracen stones because they were also pagan or pagan non non christian um so so it's kind of been bastardized to um, sarsen stone uh, which is what we call them now but it's got a kind of a lovely folk uh, layer of historical meaning to it as well Thank you. It's a lovely description, the best description I've had from anybody that knows about what Sarsen stones are and why so. Right. For those of you who are used to watching um, a uh, an Edward Stanford Travel Writers Festival and are predetermined to shut off at 45 minutes, we've got a special treat for you. Uh, Marianne has very kindly agreed to continue chatting with me for an extra 10 minutes and to do a short reading because there's so much fascinating stuff, it's hard to fit into 45 minutes. So we're going to end on one final artifact one final entry in secret britain before we have a reading from which sort of takes us back to orkney actually uh, but can you tell us of the value and the importance and the history behind um the vale of york why you take us to the vale of york okay so this is really cool uh, you'll see a picture of it it is a um a little cup that is solid silver it's gilded so covered in gold it dates to around the mid 800s AD and it was discovered by two metal detectorists, a father and son in 2007. And when they first got the signal and they started looking, they had permission from the landowner. They were doing everything totally legit and, and properly. And when they first got the signal and um, they pulled this circular cup thing out of the uh, or kind of started to unearth it they didn't pull it up started to unearth it and went oh it's an old toilet ball cock and then went hang on a minute it's filled with coins 
and these are old coins. Um, one of the detectorists, metal detectorists are often incredibly well versed in, in the finds, in coinage, things like that. They're, they're really good artifact specialists. Um, and he went, hang on a minute, this is a penny from Alfred the Great. We need to stop because we found treasure. And so they alerted the authorities, they protected the site, and then it was carefully sort of forensically excavated. And the whole block of soil and the cup and everything around it was taken to the British Museum. And they excavated this little cup. It took them a week to do it because they excavated it a centimetre at a time. So they knew exactly where every single coin was because that enables us to understand how the coin, how the coins were filled, whether they were all poured in at once, whether they were put in in different little bags and then the bags have rotted away and stuff like that. So you can find out lots and lots of information from, from that kind of careful forensic excavation, as well as all the environmental analysis that would otherwise be lost if you just shoved a spade in and dug it out and went, oh, I found a shiny thing. Uh, so they didn't do that, which was absolutely fantastic and definitely the right thing to do. Inside the cup were um, like uh, 60, 60 odd pieces of, of metal, mostly silver. There was a golden arm ring. There was um, 617 coins and the coins date from later than the cup. From the analysis of the cup, it looks like it was made, crafted in the mid 800s AD, and it was probably made in uh, the Frankish Empire, so like modern day France and Germany, but it's inspired by Persian textiles. So the thing about the Vale of York Horde is that it sort of indicates to us that in the ninth century, ours was a very cosmopolitan, it was a very cosmopolitan international world in many ways. And there's probably the reason that that, Frankish cup inspired by Islamic Persian um, uh, um, textiles ended up in a field near Harrogate is because it was either looted from a monastery by Vikings or given to Anglo-Scandinavians, so people who'd settled, begun to settle or were still raiding in, um, in Britain, uh, given as a gift. And the coins range from pennies of Alexander the Great, Anglo-Scandinavian coins that are minted in York and there's really cool ones where it says St Petri uh, which is St Peter the patron saint of York because the, by this point the Vikings are converted to Christianity the, the settlers are converted to Christianity but Petri is spelled with the I the final I is in the shape of Thor's hammer which is just awesome I love that um but not only that, there's also Frankish deniers, so coins from the Frankish Empire, and there are also 15 Islamic dirhams. So from Afghanistan, from the Middle East, and from what is modern day Uzbekistan. So some of those coins were minted in Samarkand, and they end up in a field, in a cup, in a field in Harrogate. We don't know why the hoard was buried, but the, the latest coin, that was, uh, that was buried, looked very, very new. And it's minted saying Athelstan, King of all the Britons. Now, King Athelstan was Alfred's grandson, and he is basically the first king to have ruled over a, a united England um, because he um, conquered York from the, from the Vikings, from the Viking leaders, and then he got... Um, a, a kind of acknowledgement of overlordship from from Scotland and from from the kings in Cumbria, and so basically he had done what his granddad had wanted to do, which which was unite England and rule everywhere. They were kind of really expansionists, the the Alfred Athelstan line, and um, so Athelstan, as soon as he got this agreement. And, and all the kings had met up in Cumbria, and then he goes to York and he, he gets these coins minted saying, Athelstan, king of all Britain. Yeah, let's do this, because what's on a coin is true. Everyone knows that. You know, it's like good PR. It's in everyone's pockets. Um, and and it's kind of gives you absolute legitimacy. You can't really mess about with a coin. You can't say it's lying uh, as easily as, as kind of hearsay in the marketplace. Um, but the reason that we think we can date the burial of this hoard to 927 or 928 AD is because this Rex Totius Britannia 
this King of All Britain coin is in the pot, but it looks like it's barely been in circulation. So that's a good way to date co coin hoards. We reckon that's when it was buried. Why was it buried? We don't know. There were definitely skirmishes. Maybe this was a Viking family or a Viking community going, <gasps> like, we are in trouble. Let's bury this. Let's come back for it. And the thing about hoards is that sometimes things are buried as a kind of an offering to the gods or the ancestors or to get rid of it. But this looks like it was buried very carefully with every intention of someone coming back to get it. And we just don't know why they didn't make it. I know that during lockdown, a lot of friends of mine, in fact, and some very responsible people in the publishing industry and, uh, um, and, pub and, and literary agents have either bought or been given metal detectors because we can't go far and wide. We can only explore our local areas as part of our exercise. What recommendation would you give to those who are new to metal detecting, who don't want to break the rules and who want to be responsible? Have you got a sort of a, a, a top couple of tips for them, please, Marianne? Yes. OK, so first of all, I'm not sure that we are currently allowed to metal detect until the lockdown eases, because I think it'd probably be a stretch to say that's exercise. But anyway, that aside, um, join a club. Join a responsible club that has signed up to the Code of Responsible Metal Detecting and then go to finds.org.uk, which is the Portable Antiquities scheme site that is run by the British Museum and not only are there uh, the, the information and the rules about what to do if you find something that's treasure, what counts as treasure, it's also got loads of information about how to record all the things that aren't a million pounds worth of you know um, Anglo-Saxon and Viking gold and silver. When you find something that may well be of interest to researchers, to the public, because this is our shared heritage, it's not for you to kind of dig up and flog on eBay. So, so find out what the rules are, get permission from the landowner, join a club, and then um, get to know your local fines liaison officer. So that's the official person who will be able to advise you on identifying things that you found, what to do if you find something significant. Um, and also metal detectorists are out there in the countryside. So keep your eyes peeled because there are lots of people doing the wrong thing. So if you see nighthawks, if you see people doing illegal metal detecting, skulking around farms, then let the authorities know, let the landowners know, because you're the eyes and ears of the community. And if you're doing it properly, it can be an incredible benefit and you're a wonderful part of the heritage community. If you're doing it not properly, then you're just breaking the law. You're as bad a criminal as any other criminal. You need to stop right now. And we need to call out people who are doing the wrong thing as well. Yeah. For those of you who listen to Radio 4 and specifically the Archers, you'll know this is a very, very timely issue around uh, uh, farm owners at the minute. Do the right thing. Finally, Marianne, can we please come to the reading that you've kindly agreed to give us from your latest book, Secret Britain, which takes us to where we've not yet been geographically in the UK. We've been to Wales. I'm sorry, Northern Ireland, we haven't had time to touch on you today. I do apologise. We will come to you at another stage. But you're going to bring us up to... I've got to apologise even more to Northern Ireland because they're not even in the book. Terribly sorry, guys. I have to do one Britain and Ireland. I wasn't going to say I was going to shoulder that blame myself, Marianne, and, and, and accept it as my own rather than yours. However, we are going to go up to Orkney, if we may please, Marianne Ahota. So I'm, go I'm going to take you to Aberdeenshire now, to a place called Tomnaveri, and it's a, another stone circle that is very different to Stonehenge. It's a recumbent stone circle. So I'm going to read the entry to you. Shall I show you a picture of it? There you go. Look, isn't it strange? Ooh. And hang on. So this is recumbent. So this one, yeah, recumbent as in lying down. This is the recumbent stone. And these recumbent stone circles have these two flankers and then this lying down stone, which is always the biggest stone in the circle. And so the question is, is it a kind of a, a window? Is it an altar? We're not really sure. <clears throat> it, sits up on a, it sits up on a wide hilltop just east of the Cairngorm Mountains. The views are endless and the skies massive. This may just be the reason someone built this monument, a recumbent stone circle, 4,500 years ago. 
There are just 100 circles of this type and they're only found in the northeast of Scotland, mostly in Aberdeenshire. And their most striking feature is a massive stone lying down on its side, the recumbent, in the southern or southwestern part of the circle. The ground surface beneath the recumbent is always carefully smoothed, but strangely, it's not always to make the top side flat. Sometimes the surface echoes the line of the landscape horizon behind it. On either side of the recumbent are two tall standing stones. These are the flankers. Often one is tall and narrow and the other is shorter and fatter. The rest of the stones circle out in descending height order, so the smallest stone is at the far side, standing opposite the massive recumbent. We know that the Tomnaveri hilltop was used for funeral pyres around 2500 BC, on the cusp of the transition between Stone Age and Bronze Age. You can still see the remains of the stone cairn that was built over the bone fragments and charcoal from the pyre. And then shortly afterwards, the builders came back and they constructed this stone circle around the cairn. More than a thousand years later, new people came here and they buried someone's cremated remains at the centre of the by then ancient cairn and circle. And most unusually, cremated remains were also added to the monument in medieval times, between 1400 and 1600, a staggering 4,000 years after its first use. There are many theories about recumbent stone circles. Some people think that the recumbents represent blocked doorways or gateways, either to keep things in the circle or to hold them out. Others suggest the recumbent and flankers are an altar or a viewing window, either of the landscape beyond or for the observations of the moon, the stars and the planets, or perhaps performance of rituals related to these celestial events. Certainly the view of the mountain Loch Nagar seen through the flankers is striking. And if Tom Neveri is aligned with the heavens, it seems to be focused on the winter night sky. Looking from the northeastern side of the circle across to the recumbent, the sun sets onto the altar stone every day between October and February. The winter full moon travels above it. And on the night of the midwinter solstice, the red stars Aldebaran and Betelgeuse set to the right white star Sirius sets to the left and Orion's belt sets right on top of it. This strange and ancient circle contains many stones with inclusions of quartz, so in moonlight and firelight they would glimmer and twinkle like the orbs in the sky above. Without doubt this is a circle of the night and a circle of death, but it is perhaps also a circle of cyclical seasonal life. Marianne, with all that you know about archaeology and anthropology, what do you hope, what, what great mystery is there still, what great question is hitherto unanswered that you hope we can answer in the next 10, 20 years, given the new techniques, given the new technology we have available? Is there a burning issue where you think, I really want to know how that happened or why that happened or who did that? In the places that we don't yet know about. So... I, so um, I don't know if you'll remember, lots of people saw the kind of news articles in those really hot summers. Loads of crop marks were, were showing up in in fields uh, because because of the differential ways that the kind of the grass was dying, basically, or, or kind of things were getting burnt out. So we could see all these shapes in the in the in the in the earth. Um, very unusual kind of square shaped uh, enclosures, uh, whole new Iron Age villages that we didn't know about, all sorts of things. Um, and I think if we don't know it, we can't protect it. So I think for me, I'm hopeful that we will be able to identify more places um, that are worthy of protection and investigation. And I think the, the other thing that I would really hope for is that all of us have an opportunity to embrace that uh, as our own heritage, that it's not something that belongs to other people or isn't to do with us this is ours this is a kind of a shared um asset that we should all value and treasure and have confidence and feel the right to embrace and explore because it's not just about kind of people who've been living in britain since forever when you look at the history of our island 
it has always been about new people coming in and making sense of what came before. I mean, my mum is Indian and my dad is Polish. So these aren't my ancestors in any biological way, but they are absolutely my ancestors in every cultural and spiritual and psychological way that is relevant. So if you're if this isn't part of your kind of family heritage, it doesn't matter. It's still part of your cultural heritage. It's yours. Absolutely. That's very elegantly put. Thank you. Do I, does memory serve? I seem to remember in the summer of 76, it was Cambridge University, a couple of very smart students from Cambridge that hired a light aircraft and took a camera aloft and photographed a lot of the sites that were revealed during the dehydration. And it was sort of a very early tentative step towards aerial archaeology that now through remote sensing we've got to become we, we've become very very familiar with uh the, yeah they still send photographers up the ordnance survey have um aircraft that do aerial photography uh historic england um commission aerial photography as well it really it really makes a difference to how you you can see the world and the thing that i love is that you know that technology is now available to all of us um so again it, it's sort of uh you know it, it makes heritage accessible and it makes the exploration and the discovery and the curiosity um, ours for the taking. Yeah. And and you don't need to go and wander. You don't need to walk 20 miles. If you're able to, if you're if you're you can be an armchair archaeologist very, very easily, and you can do incredible pieces of citizen science research. You can get involved with with um research work, whatever your your physical abilities, uh, there's a way to get involved. Tell us how. Uh, I'd say Google or get in touch with uh, local history societies. Uh, look on the finds.org.uk website because they've got links to um, research projects that need um, support. Uh, Current Archaeology, the magazine, has a fantastic uh, database of different projects that are going on, community led and a lot of uh, projects now which are uh, uh, collaborations between professional archaeologists and interested amateurs. Um, and I mean amateur, not in a kind of disparaging way. I mean, like, you might also just have a day job as well. Um, but some of the most informed, most passionate people I've met don't do this for a living, but are very much engaged. And that is just wonderful. I think it's an amazing thing about Britain that we are really, we really care about our past. And our past is so complex and so fascinating. It's right that we do. Exactly. Marianne, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to an extended event uh, due to the natures of, uh, of technology somehow uh, for as part of the Edward Stanford Travel Writers Festival 2021, the special limited digital edition. You've been talking to Marianne Ahota about her fantastic book, Secret Britain. It is just beautifully published, beautifully written, and has such wonderful photographs as that in. We'll leave you to discover the treasures that lie within and the treasures that lie without. Uh, in your local area. Be sensible mental detectorists, but keep your eyes to the ground sometimes as well as skywards. You never know what lies beneath your feet. Marianne, thank you so much for the generosity of your time and the absolute generosity and comprehensiveness of your answers. It's been a real pleasure to have you at the festival. Thank you for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'd love to go up in an aeroplane and spot archaeological sites. I'll go full leather jacket, whip, fedora. Thank you, Marianne and Paul, for that event so brilliantly bringing our past to life. So, discover the treasures that lie within. Secret Britain Unearthing Our Mysterious Past by Marianne Hotter is waiting to be unearthed at stanford.co.uk.